This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, hi there. Always a good thing to see your smiling faces. Ray is off this week, but that's the only change. We still have a great show for you. Now, coming up, when he's not attending to patients, this full-time nurse is helping cowboys avoid disaster. John Holcomb reports on a rodeo clown who says, although it's a dangerous job, it's part of his family heritage. Also on the show, what began as a one-man operation in the 70s has now grown to become a bustling family business with over 150 seasonal workers. The important decision Baker Farms made that took them to the next level. Plus, the unique partnership between UGA and area sod farmers. We'll hear from two well-known figures in the industry about the many exciting things that are on the horizon. All this and more starting right now on the Farm Monitor. Saving lives is what Trent McFarland does. When he's not attending to patients as a full-time nurse, you'll find Trent traveling the country protecting cowboys from a raging 2,000-pound bull. One of the perks of being a rodeo clown, I guess. John Holcomb reports on Trent's desire to stare danger in the face and how he's not the first in his family to do so. Meet Trent McFarland. Trent is a professional rodeo clown that's getting ready by putting on his signature makeup. It's second nature these days for Trent, especially since he's been putting it on since he was 13 when his father first asked him to join him in the arena. Most kids are born into a rich family and I got extremely lucky and was born into a rodeo clown family. So when other fathers are teaching their sons how to throw a football or hit a baseball or cool stuff, my dad was teaching me how to put on makeup. He has since continued to put on that makeup since those childhood days and for 11 months out of the year, you can find him and his wife and kids at rodeos all across the country. Cracking jokes, making people smile, and helping make the rodeo go smoothly. I'm hired to be the entertainer, the comedian. Throughout the show, it's my job to help during transitions from one event to the other when there's a break in the arena. And if something goes wrong, it's my job to say, hey, hey, look at me while they're doing something in the background. He also serves another purpose. And for that purpose, he is assigned the unofficial title of Bull Target. Now, during the bull riding, I tr transition a little bit from an entertainer to more of a safety person. I'm in the barrel. I'm the barrel man, which means if something bad goes on, I can run up in there with the heavy artillery, and uh, I'm the last line of defense. When bullfighters get wiped out. I go in and, and do whatever I can to take the pressure off of them and give the bull a great big target to look at and come to. When he's not dancing around in the arena or dodging bulls, you can find him assisting people in another way, in surgery as a nurse. So, you know, working in surgery as a, a registered nurse first assist is my title. And it's really cool, you know, I, my ADD that I have in the arena, the other side of ADD is hyper-focus. So when we get in those really intense cases, I'm zoned in. You know, it works really good, crosses over. Living the life of a nurse and on the road as a rodeo clown is busy, but he says he wouldn't have it any other way, especially when he has his family by his side the whole time. I truly enjoy doing what I do, and, and a majority of that is being on the road with my family. He has also roped his wife Wendy into his act and even takes the kids into the arena sometimes. And she's a big part of all the acts that I do, and, and the boys, you know, I got three-year-old and two-year-old, Cody and Ryder, and they're coming along nicely. You know, they help me from time to time. I'll get them out in the arena and they love the spotlight, you know, and it, it's fun. But I'm trying to keep it fun for them. Keeping it fun just in case one day they decide to continue the family business. Something that Trent says he wouldn't mind one bit. Well, I would be extremely honored for my kids to want to be a rodeo clown, but just to be growing up around this type of environment is important to me. You know, some of the happiest memories I have of my growing up you know, because from time I was, what, 13, 14, until my mid-20s, my dad and I rodeoed together about every weekend. We are extremely close. Reporting in Perry for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. 
With more people making a conscious effort to eat healthier these days, Growing Greens has become a big business around the country. And you can find one of those top producers right here in Georgia, where Baker Farms has everything they need to see their product from the seed to the shelves all under one roof. Daddy wanted, had, has always had dreamed of farming, had worked in the industry, uh, in the industrial field, come back into the field of farming and, 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 and hit the ground running. Obviously started small. It was very uh, family oriented at the time. Uh, everybody worked and did everything. I drove tractors and toted buckets and Joe has too. And we worked a, a good, good bit uh, as we grew up in the farming field. And around 2000, you know, we decided we wanted to do something a little different, something that everybody else wasn't doing. So we began to put in um, collards, kale, mustard, turnips, uh, we grew them uh, from anywhere from the, the dozens that you see on the market. Uh, then we, we transferred to the box greens. And um, then in probably 2015, we decided that we wanted to take it to the next level and we started doing a value added uh, pre-chopped, pre-washed, ready to eat greens. This is, this is a process of, of, of getting something as, as prepared as possible to be able to serve and do that in the safest possible way. We, uh, we, do, uh, we have modified our system, uh, whereas a lot of places do just a single or possibly a double wash. We do a true triple wash and we, we use the, the, the proper amount of chemicals and multiple te testing regimens to make sure when that ending process comes around, you've got the best, most cleanest, safest product that we can provide to the consumers. You know, I don't think that anybody can do but a certain amount of things and do a good job at it. And I think the marketplace is so competitive now that there's that you have to maintain top quality in whatever you do. From the consumer end to the retail end, they, they demand that you stay on top of your game. And um, I think that if you're not changing and if you're not upgrading and adapting, then I think you're falling behind. It's like anything else. There's certain times of the year that it's, it's not difficult at all. Um, but there's other times of the year uh, now that we're going into the spring uh, and then when we go into the summer, uh, it gets pretty challenging to me. You know, greens like cool weather. They don't like 95 degree weather. So uh, in the summertime, it's a challenge. But, you know, during the summertime, we transist some of our product and some of our productivity all the way to Michigan. We, you know, we, we've got uh, boots on the ground, uh, our own crews in Michigan, where we're cutting product there. Well, the best, there's, you know, you can't survive without it. I mean, you have got to have, from the time you put that plant in the ground to, about a, to the time you put it on that shelf, it's got to be, you know, A, a quality. Uh, there's no room for error. It's humbling in the sense that we were able to grow from a small uh, family-owned farm to what we are now. And, and, it's, and it gives us great pride that we can, again, provide that product to people um, that is a good, wholesome, safe product that they can take then home to their family. And really, they become sort of as part of our family. Well, stay with us when we come back. Why experts say now is a great time to be in the turf industry. The land-grant university system is the greatest educational uh, system that has ever been invented. We are the envy of the world and the University of Georgia is an amazing example of, of, of a powerful agriculture institution. The idea behind it was that we were a growing country and that we didn't know how to farm very well and that we needed local educators, what became extension agents but follow all the way through to the university through breeders and scientists who were adapting varieties both of seeds and of agriculture techniques that were based on the region, on the area, the expertise of the, of the environmental realities of the region because the United States was so vast and so geographically diverse. To have a, a, an institution that was devoted to agriculture for that state was, was key. And that's why the Land Grant University was created. It's a response to what the food culture, the specific regional food culture is asking you it, it wants to grow. So chefs and land grants to me you know, they, they are a marriage in heaven. You know, I have a style of cooking that's very uh, simple. Mm -hmm. I, that drove me to concentrate a 
on flavors in a way that I don't think I would have been as disciplined to concentrate on. And that led me to, well, how is this carrot grown versus this carrot? Because this carrot tastes a lot better, and this carrot's more memorable. What is it about that carrot? Well, I learned that a carrot was grown in a certain kind of soil. Well, okay, well, how'd you get that soil so it could be replicated for the farmer over here? Well, that required a certain kind of rotation in the crop and a certain kind of cover crops. And okay, well, what are those? And what are those other crops that need to be eaten to get the soil ready for that carrot? Oh, well, that's about you know this brassica and this legume and oh okay so I got to support those for this farmer too if I'm going to support the carrot it sort of like keeps going further well, what seed carrot did you use you know that's really where I should have started I got to that as a kind of late inning revelatory question but it was really like that should have been the first one because the seed determined the flavor because it was selected for a certain kind of flavor and as I said determined the kind of blueprint for how that farm was going to work you know? I came to the idea of eating cover crops based on that conversation that we started with you know how do you get that great carrot a lot of the reason had to do with there were this suite of other crops that were intermingled before that <coughs> carrot ever came into the ground. And that locked and loaded the soil with the kind of fertility it needed to give me the carrot that I was so celebrating. Okay, well, if I, if I really want that carrot, then I've got to support that cover crop that went in before it. Well, what's the cover crop? Oh, well, it's clover. And what I discovered is clover has lost real estate for the farmer. In other words, I'm paying for the clover through the carrot. I started to say, well, why is it a sunk cost? Why can we, you know, can we do something here? And I started to taste it. Well, it's older, inedible, but young shoots of clover, just delicious. And I started looking at that and other cover crops and realizing that at a certain stages for these cover crops, they're not just edible, they're like stunningly delicious. So one of the job of a chef who is a proponent of this thing is he needs to get the food culture interested in clover. So I think there's a whole world that, of possibilities for cover crops that are edible. The more things change, the more they stay the same. So they say, right? Well, for the UGA turf team in Tifton, that is absolutely not the case. Something new two years ago is now old technology. In fact, at this exact moment, they're developing a new hybrid of grass that requires less mowing. And with partnerships like the one they have with the Super Sod in Fort Valley, the technology will only get better with time. You know, it's, it's a pretty good time to be in the turf industry. Uh, you know, new home sales are picking up a little bit. They're still off of their peak in 2006. And our business is directly tied to home sales. Um, putting in grass in new homes is the biggest portion of our market. Um, but it, overall, it's a pretty good time to be in the, in the turf business. You know, wet years like this one have their challenges just like dry years do. So my favorite part of the job is actually new hybrids and we try to make about five or 10,000 new hybrids every year. And through years and years of testing, working with uh, homeowners, working with sod farmers, we take that from five or 10,000 down to one over a period of uh, you know, 10, 20 years. So, but my favorite part is the unknown. Every year, those 5,000 plants could be the next superstar. And that's my favorite part, but it's also great to see a partnership with say the industry here today at Super Sod. You know, we worked on it for 22 years in Tifton and they've taken it in the last several years and have taken it from, you know, a 10 square foot plot in Tifton to thousands and thousands of acres uh, out here in the real world. So that's fun also. We really tried to change the face of the industry. Um, for a long time, our number one sale uh, turf type was, was 419 Tiff Way Bermuda. It was developed in Tifton in, in 1960 is when it was released. And there's not much you use in your daily life that's still from 1960. Pickup trucks didn't have air conditioning in 1960 for, for to give you a little reference point. So um, we're really now in this, this stage where we're accelerating, um, looking at new turf grasses got a lot of new things to offer that we haven't just five years ago. Tiff Tuff being primarily the one, a grass that's bred specifically to use less water, has tons of other benefits as well. But you know, it's really time to, to look. The industry's changed so much and our products have changed so much. It's time, you've got an old lawn, it's time to think about something different. To step back, if you asked on a national scale what the most important trait is, it would be drought tolerance. But it's not always dry. and 
Ben and his family have worked with the Tifton program for, for decades. And a couple years ago, he actually stopped in and was looking at new zoysia grass crosses. And there was one in particular that he and I went to and it was very low growing and kind of through research in the last couple years, we're noticing it needs to be mowed less. So that's a whole different avenue with a different species, but it's also one that I think would interest homeowners as the reduction of mowing. Um, so a lot of research yet to do on that one. You know, it took 22 years to develop Tiff Tough. We hope it doesn't take 22 years for this, this new one, but um, whether it's disease tolerance, drought tolerance, low mowing, those are all ideas we're trying to follow up on there at the Tifton Research Station. Well, don't forget, if you missed any part of this story or others on today's show, you can still see them in their entirety at our YouTube channel, the Georgia Farm Monitor. Plenty of stuff to choose from. In fact, the archives go all the way back to 2009. And while you're there, keep clicking and like the Georgia Farm Monitor Facebook page. Send us some feedback as well. If you have a story idea or if you just want to leave us a comment or suggestion, send us a message either on Facebook or at the address on your screen. That is news at farm-monitor.com. Now time for our final break. When we come back, Extension Corner with the Monitor's gardening expert, Paul Beglis. We'll have the do's and don'ts on how to plant those shrubs. Stay tuned. One of the things that we're always trying to do when we manage forests is to be able to provide a range of habitat conditions. Some of the species that are most threatened that are often listed in terms of endangered status, potential endangered status, are species such as the California spotted owl and the fisher. How do you accommodate those kind of species, provide habitat for them, and also be able to have reduced fuel conditions and in some places more open forests, so when the fire does come through, it doesn't all just burn up into the overstory canopy, one of the, the positive outcomes of having this variable forest condition is, is that you would have places with higher tree density and higher canopy cover that could support habitat for some of these sensitive species such as the owl and the fisher. We have been looking at fisher response to forest management here for probably just over 10 years. One of the challenges in understanding the effects of tree mortality on Fisher is that the mortality has happened really fast over the past two to three years. We still have Fishers living in the same areas that they have for years, and so on the surface it might look like they're not responding to the tree mortality, but in effect it's likely that they're staying there out of habit. We need to understand not only what the historical conditions were how we can actively move the forest in that direction and at the same time understand what the effects are going to be on the various wildlife species we're concerned about. We have done a lot of research and have a lot of information on various wildlife habitat requirements and so our challenge now is to integrate those two concepts. Where in a resilient forest can we conserve wildlife habitat? A fisher loves dense canopy, large trees, but it doesn't need that over 100% of the landscape. I've been working uh, with spotted owls conducting long-term research for the last 17 years. We've been monitoring California spotted owl populations up and down the Sierra Nevada to estimate population trends and, and track the status of the populations. Spotted owls use large tree, high canopy cover habitat for nesting and roosting. It's a particularly important uh, habitat type for them. The challenge is providing that large tree dense forest habitat within the context of restoring these forests to a more open condition. The research being done in the experimental forests is very fundamental to uh, advancing our understanding of what the effects of these various restoration treatments might be on basic forest structure, but also the response of wildlife. I'm Paul Pugliese with the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension. Today we're going to talk about planting trees and shrubs in the landscape. First thing you want to do when you buy a plant is take a look at those roots at the nursery. Don't be afraid to pull it out of the pot and see, do we have healthy roots or sick roots? This is a great example of a healthy root system. Nice and full all the way to the bottom of the pot. Uh, nice white or sort of uh, light green colored roots. Uh, that's a good healthy root system that you want to start with. 
In contrast, if you pull out a plant and it looks something like this, the roots are black or rotten and there's no roots at the bottom of the plant. This is a good example of a plant that's probably been overwatered in the nursery and may already have a root rot or disease problem. This is not a plant that you want to take home with you because this will actually continue to be a problem and probably won't make it through the first year. So it's very important if you're going to spend a lot of time and money on planting stuff that you start with good healthy plants in the landscape. So today we're going to look at planting a hydrangea and the technique that we're going to use today is the same whether you're planting um, a pecan tree or a fruit tree in your backyard or any other shrub or ornamental in your landscape. The first thing you want to do is make sure you dig a good hole. And it's more important to dig a wide hole than a deep hole. A lot of people dig holes way too deep. And when you do that, that'll actually catch water and cause root rot problems in, in your shrubs. So spend your time digging a nice wide hole. It doesn't have to be very pretty. Um, at least two to three times wider than the root ball in the container that you buy. Okay? When you're checking the level to make sure that it's at the right height, I always say make sure that your pot is about an inch or two above level. Okay? It's better to plant a little bit on the high side than too deep. We always get questions about adding soil amendments. Should I add compost or organic matter to the soil? Research at the University of Georgia and many other universities has actually shown there's no benefit to adding any organic amendments to your soil. In fact, it's more important to take the time to break up the clods, if you, especially if you've got clay soil, and loosen up that soil, and those roots will do perfectly fine in that without any soil amendments. Also, the problem that we see a lot of times is people will add amendments to the soil and it'll actually add too much and it acts like a sponge in the hole. And that's the worst thing you can do to roots because just like a sponge, it'll stay too wet or too dry and those extreme fluctuations in soil moisture are not good for that plant as far as getting established. So when you take the plant out of the pot, you wanna be very gentle. Um, one of the things you need to remember when you're picking up a plant is to never grab it by the stems, especially with trees and shrubs. You can actually break those stems and cause damage to that plant. So it's important to put your, your hand right at the crown of the plant turn it over and put the weight of the root ball in your hand and as you remove the, the container gently just slip it away and you can take a look at those roots. In this particular case there are some nice healthy roots. This is still a very young plant that hasn't really filled out with roots to the bottom yet. That's perfectly fine and in this case we really don't need to do anything as far as uh, scoring the root ball or, or loosening up the roots. It's perfectly fine to go ahead and put it in the ground exactly as is. Now when you set it back in here you want to check again make sure that it's slightly above grade. And again, it's always better to plant a little on the high side than too deep. There are certain plants that really liked well-drained soil. Things like azaleas and rhododendrons, even blueberries, I would actually take it and plant it maybe two or three inches on the high side, okay? Uh, but in this case, level is perfectly fine with a hydrangea. If the bottom is firm, then that's a good foundation for that plant. If you dug too deep and you backfilled it, you don't want it to settle behind, okay? So make sure you have a nice firm foundation. You can even step on that underneath to make sure it's nice and solid. When you get ready to plant, you start backfilling around the edges with a shovel. And again, make sure that that soil is nice and loose before you throw it back in the hole. Continue to backfill around this plant. This should be a happy little hydrangea. The last thing you want to do is maybe add a little bit of fertilizer to get it started. We recommend a starter fertilizer such as 888 or 101010. All you need is about one or two tablespoons to get it started. For more information, contact your local county extension office or go to our website at ugaextension.org and continue to follow us on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Well, Paul, thank you so much. And that's going to do it for this week's edition of the Farm Monitor. Here's a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm. Be sure you check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and with us here on the show. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week right here on the Farm Monitor.